Um, tonight, uh, I, um, I had this ready a couple weeks ago because I was supposed to, uh, so I don't know this, if this is left over or not. We had the ice storm, and so I lost my opportunity. So now I have my opportunity tonight. This is just kind of a, uh, I want you to wonder with me tonight. Did you ever wonder about anything? Jim, do you ever wonder about anything? Um, there's lots of things to wonder about, but lots of things to wonder, besides the fact that, that God would come in the flesh and die for you and I. Uh, but there are some, some more minor things to wonder about than that. Um, Book of Exodus, chapter 18, we're going to start there and <clears throat> look at a few things tonight. When you say, when someone says, starts talking about the law and grace to you, what does your mind automatically think of when you hear the term law? Law of Moses, right? Ten Commandments. So Exodus chapter 18, something to wonder about. And um, this is the story where Moses' father-in-law comes to visit him. And he, um, he, he shows what he, Moses shows his father-in-law what he's, doing here. It says uh, in verse number 12, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Does something, um, does something kind of jump out at you there? Yeah, this is before the this is before what we always think of as the law. It's before that. When you read Romans chapter 6 and we just turn over there for a second, Romans Romans chapter 6 In verse 14 and 15, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, we have countless, countless arguments and books written about <laughs> law and grace and the, how the two, you know, either compare or how they agree or how they disagree or what, what things that we fight about. And he says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. And what's he doing in the book of Romans? He's, com he's basically showing that if you're a Jew, then you've been given the law. If you're not a Jew, then you have your own law, but there's still a law. Is that basically right? I mean, he says, yeah, if, you're a, if you're a Gentile, you, you have a law. They be, it becomes a law unto themselves because you accuse or excuse one another and all of, that, all of those type of things. In um, Genesis chapter number 26... And verse, <clears throat> um, the promise to Abraham in verse number four, God speaking to Abraham says, and I'll make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto thy seed all these countries and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And what does the seed refer to in verse four? We know from scripture in thy seed, Christ, right? And thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Really? And this was how long before the law? 400 years, right? And the law which Moses gave cannot disannul what Abraham had. That's what the scripture says, basically, right? 
So the things that we have read now are all before the law. So what does scripture tell us that there was in existence before what we normally think of as the law? God had statutes and commandments that he expected uh, would be complied with. At least from the, from the scriptures, that's kind of what we, what we see. And when the people came to Moses, they came and he judged between them and he made them, and the thing that he used to judge between them, according to Moses, were, were the statutes of God. The statutes of God. And so somehow there was a, uh, a law. Somehow they understood some things. All of these things happened before uh, the law of Moses was given. In Exodus chapter 32, and I'll read this. You don't have to turn there. If you're taking notes, you might write it down. Exodus 32, 7 and 8. When, when Moses is up on the mountain, before God gives him the Ten Commandments, and gives him all the rest of the law. The Lord says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which, now, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I, what? Commanded them. Commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, have worshipped it, have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So all of these things... I have been given to us, and they were all they were all, I guess, known by these people before God met Moses on Mount Sinai, and before He had uh, the written law that then, all, all, which was the covenant between God and the house of Israel, and He said, "These are my laws, and you should keep." Now, everyone thinks what what everyone thinks of as the law. We can we can find Leviticus chapter number 26 it's heavy stuff for a Wednesday huh? <clears throat> Leviticus 26 and 46 verse 46 this is what we think of as the law these are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Now, that's more like it, right? That's the law. We know what that is because we can read it all in the book of Leviticus and they knew exactly what they, were, uh, what they were supposed to be doing. So that's the law that we all, that we all kind of understand. But did God have laws before that? Well, it would appear so. And uh, after all, Paul does say that sin reigned from Adam to Moses, even though there wasn't the kind of law that we think of when we say law of Moses. In Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, we know that there was at least one law. Right? And that one law... That I've given you everything, you can do anything you want. And they were completely innocent, as we know. It was, that was known as the age of innocence. After they fell, it was conscience. But the, in innocence, they could do anything they wanted to, except they had one law, which was what? Don't eat of that tree. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was in the middle of the garden. I don't know if God had a big sign in front of it that says... This is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I think it's more like he could have picked any tree in the garden to be the knowledge of good and evil. And that would have been the tree that they decided to eat of. But be that as it may, that's the, that's the law. And so did God have a law then? He did, didn't he? He had at least one. By the time we get to Cain and Abel, in Genesis chapter 4, if you want to go there, Genesis chapter 4 Beginning in verse number 3, it says, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain 
and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, that is, Abel's desire would be unto Cain, because he was the oldest, and thou shalt rule over him. But Cain's offering was not accepted. Now, you can read all kinds of commentaries, and they'll tell you all kinds of, I mean, the reason that, that Cain's offering was not accepted. And the one that is the most, I guess, maybe well accepted, is that it was not a blood offering. But in order for Cain to get a blood offering, what would he have had to do? Yeah, he probably would have had to buy one from his little brother. Because he grew stuff on the ground. And that was his lot. And God never said, you should have brought blood. He said, you know, if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted. Right? That's what he said. I mean, all we can go on is what he said. So Cain's offering wasn't accepted, perhaps not because there was something wrong with the offering... That's what we would always think, right? right? Well, something wrong with his offering. Not his offering. There was something wrong with his heart. His heart was in the wrong place. The Lord accepted things for offerings besides blood. You can read that in the law in Leviticus. Um, it might have had something to do with blood. I'm not completely discounting that. But... I think if that had been really important, God would have told us that maybe. And so we're told that he did not do well and that sin lied at the door. And he was displeased with that because God, not, I don't, because God had looked at his heart. You know, God looks at your heart. Right? That's what he's displeased with is your heart. He's not necessarily displeased that you had Captain Crunch for lunch. You know, he's displeased with a heart. So he says, if he, if he does well, God says, if you do well, Abel's desire will be to, to you uh, as the elder, and you will rule over him, and, and everything will be okay, and the family will stay in order like it's supposed to, and all that. Uh, but that wasn't going to happen. You know, Esau sold his birthright, and it kind of appears that Cain may have just given his away just because of his heart, because of, because of sin. In Leviticus chapter 5, when we talk about the sin of, I have, I have read commentaries that say, well, it blood was required for a sin offering. I don't think that's true. Leviticus chapter 5, beginning in verse 11, says, But if he be not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that sinned, that would be a sin offering, wouldn't it? He that sinned shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. He shall put no oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense thereon, for it is a sin offering. Then shall he bring it to the priest. The priest shall take his handful of it, even a memorial thereof, burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. It's a sin offering. He says that several times. And the priest shall make an atonement for him as touching his sin, that he hath sinned in one of these, and it shall be forgiven him. And the remnant shall be the priests as a meat offering. So God provided for people who could not afford getting a, getting a, a blood offering, and he provided for it as a sin offering. So what the, what the basic thing is then, there's no excuse for not offering of something that we have. We don't have to be rich. The widow put her two mites in. That's what she had. God didn't expect her to bring, you know, three lambs if she only had two mites. He expected an offering of what she had. So when we get to the New Testament now, we're told about those who are under the law and those who are not under the law. So if we go to the book of Romans, back to the book of Romans. Chapter number one. 
And I've mentioned this a couple times teaching through the book of Acts, is that when Paul, when Paul talks to Gentiles about Christ, normally he does not begin with the law of Moses. When he talks to Jews about Christ, he begins with the law of Moses. And he goes to the synagogue and he presents the scripture and he argues from the scripture that Christ is the Messiah that they were expecting. But when he goes to the Gentiles, he operates, he seems to operate completely differently. So in Romans chapter 1, when talking to Gentiles, Romans, um, and, and telling them about these things, in chapter 1, beginning in verse 20, he says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. That's kind of what he, that's kind of what he told uh, the people in the book of Acts, kind of what Paul at Athens when he preached on Mars Hill. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. Now kind of think to yourself, Cain, here. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So this scripture, Romans chapter 1, could be preached to anybody since Cain and Abel, could it not? There's no, uh, there's no law of Moses there that they have to comply with and say, if you don't comply with this, you know, you can't have eternal life. It doesn't say that. So this could be applicable to those, uh, to those people. Now as to the function of the law, now, now keep this in mind as as Paul's, where he begins to talk about the law to the Gentiles. <clears throat> and then over in Romans chapter 2, when he starts talking about sin, and where we always take that and apply it to the law of Moses, remember, Paul is still continuing this same conversation. Romans chapter 2, verse 12, For as many as have sinned without law, that means apart from, you know, apart from what we would normally consider as the law, the standard, shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be what? Judged, Judged by what? The by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Then he goes on to talk about Gentiles, because that's who he's talking to. He's trying to say, look, you're, you're getting hung up with the Jewish law here. And you're Gentiles. Those things may be nice to know. Jews had an advantage because God gave them the oracles of God. He gave them the law, all of these things. He made a covenant, everlasting covenant with them. But it says, for when Gentiles, which have not the law, the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So this kind of law could have well been in existence way prior to the law of Moses, right? So when we talk about Cain and Abel, when we talk about Abraham, when we talk about Moses before the Ten Commandments, God seems to still have a law. Which show the work of the law written where? In their hearts. What do we say was Cain's problem? Heart problem. It wasn't a problem that he didn't have all of the Ten Commandments written down on his bedroom wall at home. And that he was all trying to keep those. Because you may remember that when the person that we call the rich young ruler came to Christ and said, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you're a good Jew, boy. You know, you know what you're supposed to do to inherit eternal life. And, and he said, yes, and I've done all of that. And what did Jesus say? He said, you lack one thing. You know what that one thing was? It's his heart. He said, you lack one thing. You need to take everything that you have and go sell it and give it to the poor. He could, he could have said, 
You know, he could have said anything. And the guy went away sad. Why? Because he would not give his heart to Jesus. Pretty, that's pretty simply, right? He went away because he, he, although he claimed to keep all of those rules and regulations, he wasn't willing to give his heart to Jesus. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men according to the law. Is that what it says? It is not what it says. It says, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Aren't you glad that you're going to get judged by the gospel and not by the law? No matter whether it's the law of Israel, you know, the law of Moses, or whether it's the law that was given way before the law of Moses, because no matter what law it is, you and I are not going to keep it. If there was only one law, we wouldn't keep it. And so that's what, that's what we have here. So he says that people have the work of the law written in their hearts. Now, some people's conscience can be seared with a hot iron, but that takes place after lots of disregarding the word of God. And so when you start out, for the most part, you know when you're doing right or wrong, right? And parents, that's why this is very important that you need to discipline your kids because that's how they learn these things. That's how they learn what right and wrong is. That's the law that develops in their heart. When, when they do something and they say, they don't say the law says I can't do that. They say, mom and dad says I shouldn't be doing this. That's their law. That's the law that they've got. So parents, you are very responsible tremendous responsibility because you are placing the law in their heart that they're going to judge themselves against one day and excuse themselves or accuse themselves for doing right or wrong and part of the, the problem we have in our country today is there's not that anymore you know and that's the fault of my generation and the generation directly after mine and the one after that is because we've neglected our kids and we haven't done them any favors by letting them run around and do whatever they wanted to so have the work of God written in their hearts and you will be judged by that law the law that you know because otherwise we would have to be out teaching everybody what the law of Moses said because otherwise they would never be responsible Right? You've got to know something about the rules and regulations if you're going to be held responsible for breaking them. Yeah, I know. There's, there's sacrifices for laws of ignorance. You know, Leviticus chapter 4. I know that's there. Um, but that, that was for people who were trying to keep the law as they knew it. So here, the, the law, we know that the law, whatever we consider the law to be, that right and wrong or, the, or if we're brought up under the law of Moses, that Moses, we, that it tells us what? It tells us that whatever it is, we're not good enough. We can't keep it. Even if there's only one commandment, it tells us we're not good enough. What did, what did it tell Adam and Eve? They lived the rest of their life, and Adam lived a long time. And he lived the rest of his life knowing that if I had kept, all I had to do it, just one this one stupid commandment. And I could have had eternal life right here on earth. My whole family, going, we could have had thousands of kids and everybody would have been sin free and we could have lived in the garden forever. No. No, because I blew it. Yeah, but you know what? You would have done that too. You would have done that too. In Adam, we all sin. We, we sin because we want to. Um, so that there are things that you're not aware of that are still sin. But for the most part, we are aware of things that we've done wrong. 
And how many things do you have to do wrong in order to be a sinner? <sighs> yeah, unfortunately, just one. No, there's no, there's no scales. There's no scales of justice. Yeah. said, well, I did three things wrong over here, so now I'm going to do three good things over here and try to balance the thing out so that when I stand in judgment, I'll have my little scales there. I wouldn't try taking scales to the judgment. You're going to lose that one. So in the book of Galatians, when Paul is trying to explain to the Galatians why they should not be involved in all of these people that came down from Judea that said you have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to keep your salvation. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, he says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Now, the Galatians were what? Jews or Gentiles? They were Gentiles, right? Because that's why the Judaizers came down to Galatia and tried to convince them that now that they'd accepted Christ, they need to keep the law, which they'd never had to do before because they were Gentiles. <laughs> and so on the one hand, we, we criticize the Jews for wanting to be Jewish, and then the Jews criticize the Gentiles for wanting to be Gentiles. And the fact is that there's going to be both Jews and Gentiles in heaven. <coughs> so we're going to have to get along. But one thing that we're going to have to agree on is that there's a law. It's not the same for everybody, but it doesn't matter because the purpose of the law is not the rules and regulations. The purpose of the law is to show us that we can't keep it. And so we're going to need some help. So he says in verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. What law? Whatever law you were working under. Whatever one. Because no matter what one it is, you're guilty. Isn't that the point? The point is not exactly what law we were operating under. The point is that no matter what law we were operating under, we're guilty. And so there's no way out. Otherwise, I could just try to change from one law to another. You know, they, they had that opportunity. If you wanted, if you were a Gentile and you thought you could go to heaven better being a Jew, you could be a proselyte, but you could never be a real Jew. You could just be a hanger-on. You know, you could never be a priest. You could never be involved in all of those things that you wanted to be involved with. So he says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we, must, that we might be justified by what? Faith. faith. See, faith is common to both systems. Because faith will change your heart. Faith changes your heart. And he says, after that faith has come, you're no longer under a schoolmaster. So whichever schoolmaster that was, however you define the schoolmaster, whatever law you tried to keep and you blew it, but you understand, you understood from that that you could have never kept it. It, con it now condemns you. Whatever law you operated under, it now condemns you. And so after faith has come, after we accept Christ, as he was trying to tell them in Romans and Galatians, after you accept Christ and faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. It's not valid anymore. For ye are all... Jews and Gentiles, the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, he was talking to Gentiles, the Galatians. He said, we are all. And Paul was a Jew. So he said, look, I, I grew up under the law of Moses. I couldn't keep it. You grew up over, under whatever right and wrong system you grew up under, and you didn't keep it. You don't have to grow up under the law of Moses in order to be saved. Otherwise, we, there would be no hope for us. We could never be grafted in. So he's talking to the people of Galatia. So what we have is we have Abraham believed God before the, the law of Moses, and it was counted unto him for what? Righteousness. righteousness. So there was righteousness before the law of Moses. Abel believed God before the law of Moses, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. 
his, his heart was right before God, and he brought his offering, and he brought it with a pure heart. And he knew that if he offered to God, and there must have been some conversation. You know, we talked about Moses said he had statutes. Abraham said he had statutes. Um, my, my idea is that God came down and had a pretty long talk with, with uh, Adam and Eve after that, and their family had, you know, statutes. And there were rights and there were wrongs. And those boys had been taught, because they kids learn by watching their parents. Those boys had been taught how to make their offering and, and what the attitude that they should have while doing that. Because God set the first example by offering for Adam. And so they had that, they had that example, and, and they were taught that, and they were taught how they were supposed to present themselves before God, and Cain chose not to do that. He chose to do something else. So we have Abraham, and, and we have uh, Abel, uh, and we even have Moses, who had a heart, a clean heart before God, before the law of Moses was given to him. So in Galatians chapter 3, continuing in verse 17, he says, In this I say that the covenant... Aren't you glad for the covenants? Covenants are very important. The covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ. Before. Before what? Before anything. Before anything you want to mention. Well, no matter whatever law you you grew up under or talking about. The covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ. The law, which was 430 years after. So he's talking now about Abraham. Whatever law Abraham operated under. The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, and we read that part, that we might be justified by faith. After faith has come, we no longer are under a schoolmaster, for you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So the just, the scripture says, shall live by faith. That phrase is in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Both places. Habakkuk chapter 2, it's there. And it's in the New Testament. So, we now know that we are not under the law, we are under grace. We don't have to fight about what the law is. Because no matter what law we say it is, we're guilty. Right? I know this is hard to comprehend because we always, we always think, well, I lied. And the Ten Commandments says I'm not supposed to lie. Listen, God said way before that that you weren't supposed to lie. Amen. Lying before God has never been acceptable. Adam tried that. Right? It wasn't acceptable then. So, we're, we're not under the law. We are under grace. And grace comes how? By faith. So, we're not justified by the law. We are justified by the promise. Promises are much better than law. Wouldn't you much rather have a promise than someone leave you a law and say, if you keep this, then I will do something for you? Amen. Yeah. So when your dad leaves on a trip and he says, if you be good, if I get a good report from your mother when I get home, then I'll bring you something and I'll actually give it to you. Yeah. And did that ever happen? No, you never got the good report. But if dad said, I promise that I will bring you something. He'll bring you a paddle. Well, he'll bring you something. <laughs> you probably need a paddle, but he'll bring you something. We did one year. We went to, first, to Six Flags over Texas, and we brought the kids a paddle. It, we're, we were, used it for years. <laughs> so in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, no matter how you define that, from which, whatever law you, you would like to talk about. For ye are not under the law, 
You escape from that by faith. You're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, under grace? See, this, these are the arguments we get involved in nowadays in our great society, our great religious, wonderful society that wants to be just as close to the devil as we can and still go to heaven. And so we want to say, okay, God, what can I get away with? I need some rules. Because I want to know what I can get away with and still end up in heaven. So we get all kinds of trash written about how it's okay for Christians to drink once in a while. It's okay to gamble. And it's okay to cheat on your wife if you just do it a little bit. Because yeah. it'll all be measured out. And after all, you're a man of faith. But he says, Paul says, we are not under the law. So we don't even operate that way. There's no justification how bad or how good you can be doesn't play into the, your justification. But what your heart says and what you want to do does. Because faith changes your heart. So he says, we're not under the law, but under grace. He says, God forbid. We're not. He says, the law is not going to teach you to sin. It shows you you did. Now Paul says... I know that, but he says, I, I, I try to do something. I think it's good, but I see this law that says it's bad. And so no matter what kind of relationship you try to have with a law, it is not going to help you. It's not going to help you. We need grace. We need faith. So we're not supposed to live in the law. We're supposed to live in the promise. And if we live in the promise, we'll understand that God made a promise, and we should love him because he first loved us. Amen. And so our heart will be different. I think that's called being born again. Amen. And so our heart will be different. Our relationship will be different. We won't be trying to bring an offering like Cain did and try to get away with something or not do it right. We want to do it right. So we spend the rest of our life trying to get closer to the Lord so we can do things right. Amen. Amen. We're not going to get there, but we should try. Because you'll have much more fun doing that than you will getting eaten up and spit out by the world. Amen. So we should live by the promise. Sin shall not have dominion over you. You know, the, the scripture says that, does it not? I mean, sin shall not have dominion over you but it's a hard thing to get away from, isn't it? It's a tough one. We don't like to preach on that. You know why? Because we have a really hard time living it. We don't like to preach on stuff that we have a hard time living. It's a tough one. Grace provides no excuse for sin. None. We have an account with him. We're going to stand and be judged for all the things that we've done in the flesh. I shudder to think. But that's what's going to happen. And we're going to gain or lose rewards based upon our service to our master. Just like Cain and Abel and theirs. No matter what law we started out under. So some of our favorite theology is just going to go right out the window. Theology that says, well, Christ died for my sin from now to eternity, and so I can do whatever I want because my sin's already paid for. Be real careful of that. The Bible says that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And he is talking to saved people when he says that. So, if when we sin, like 1 John 1, 8 and 9 tells us we're going to sin, but what are, what are we supposed to want to do about that? Repent, right? Confession, repentance, good for the soul. So if we sin, what happens? We look for judgment. You may remember Ananias and Sapphira. The immoral man in 1 Corinthians. You know, they expelled him from the church, took him back later. Why? My guess is he repented and made, that, and made that public. Those who took the Lord's Supper unworthily, that Paul says, people died for that. 
People died for that. In Hebrews chapter 10, <clears throat> which really goes along very well with Leviticus chapter 4, before all this started, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, where it says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, so after we're in the promise, if we sin willfully, there remaineth what? No more sacrifice for sins. No more. That's why there's going to be that judgment we talked about. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. We always like to, we always like to say that that applies to lost people. Well, it certainly does apply to lost people, but he's not writing to lost people right here. He's talking to people who have claim to have faith and grace and sin willfully. And he says, you're not going to get away with it. You're not going to get away with it. Why? Because God disciplines his children. Hebrews chapter 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. So don't be discouraged if you get a little punishment. Because what that does is it shows you God cares. If you're a kid and you're here and you get a whipping every once in a while from dad or mom, you should thank them for it. I know you won't. But it's helping to build your character. It's helping you to know right from wrong. God disciplines his children. God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Well, I don't know how that question would be answered in the day and time in which we live. But I know the implied answer in Scripture. So what law do we operate under? Romans chapter 8 and verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So we operate, we are supposed to operate with the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's our law. No matter what law we started under, whether the Ten Commandments or the law that excuses or accuses yourself or the law that Adam operated under or the law that Cain and Abel operated under or the law that Abraham operated under, all of those things... We are free of all of that by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So we have redemption through Christ. We have, the scripture says, the mind of Christ. We have forgiveness of Christ. We have life in Christ. It's the law that works in our hearts instead of the one that works in our minds. And it's all of Christ. That's the only law that makes us free. And Moses knew that. Moses knew that. Before he was given the law, he knew that. And he told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 18, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Why? The law of the spirit of life in Christ. Do you think Moses thought that he could actually keep all of those laws that just get God just gave him and that he could be perfect and go to heaven because he kept those? No. He was closer to God than that. The reason that God chose him was because he was meek and because he had a heart for God, right? So Moses knew that. And Stephen quotes that passage, by the way, when he's on trial. Um, he says... For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up of you for your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear. So there's always a law, unfortunately. There's always a law. But there's always grace. There's always the Spirit of Christ. And there's always the payment that's already been made. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pastor.